Hello, this is circulating tumor markers. Cancer is the second leading cause of death in North America. It actually accounts for more than 500,000 deaths annually. Cancer is an uncontrolled growth of cells that can develop into a tumor and spread to other areas of the body. What happens is there's a formation and spreading, which is also called metastasis or metastasizing, of tumors caused by a complex combination of inherited and acquired genetic mutations. These types of mutations include the activation of growth factors in oncogenes, an inhibition of apoptosis, which is the natural death of a cell, tumor suppressors, and cell cycle regulation genes. So when something goes wrong with one of those items, it can cause normal cells to proliferate out of control and cause what's called a tumor or a leukemia if it includes a white cell, something of that nature. When we look at cancer, we usually stage it based on tumor size, histology, lymph node involvement, and presence of metastasis, which is the spreading. There are four stages. So if one of your friends walks up to you and says their, you know, their family member is in stage six cancer, there is no such thing. There is only four stages. All right, so here's the first stage, as you can see over here on the um, left-hand side, we have a localized pituitary tumor. When you look at the tumor here, you can see all the cells are in one spot. They have not invaded any other tissues. They're not spreading throughout the body. The second stage, stage two, is the invasion of the primary tumor through the epithelium and into the blood vessels. So you can see where it was encapsulated, it has now spread out to neighboring areas, but it's still in the same general location. The next one, stage three, we see migration of the tumor into regional lymph nodes, okay? So here the tumor has spread to, it looks like an axial type of lymph node in the armpit area. Stage four is when the metastasis or spreading and invasion of tumor to distant tissues. So in this case, you can see where the tumor may have been located um, somewhere on the left-hand side of this man's body. It is now in the lungs and in the liver. That would be considered stage four. We have different types of tumor markers that we look at when we're um, in the laboratory and talking about uh, cancer. Usually, it can be used to detect and monitor cancer. Most of them are used to monitor the effectiveness of the treatment, and we're gonna talk about that in a little while. But the tumor markers themselves are produced by the tumor directly or as an effect of the tumor on the tissue that it is growing in. Okay, there's a couple different types. It could be an enzyme that we're looking for. It could be some type of a serum protein, such as a beta-2 microglobulin or other immunoglobulins, if it's a tumor that might secrete those items. It could be a hormone. It could be an oncogene, which are activated forms of normal cellular genes. It could be an oncofetal antigen, which are found in the fetus and in um, these cancer situations. Or it could be some type of a uh, receptor. So the applications of these tumor markers in the laboratory. Well, usually they're found in most normal cells, not just cancer cells. Although when somebody does have cancer, they're found in greater concentration. An example of this would be something like the prostate-specific antigen. All men have some prostate-specific antigen in their bloodstream, and that's okay. But when we start to see very, very large quantities of them, it could mean that there is cancerous tissue growing in the prostate. So therefore, we can use that to screen and detect cancer in men. And we'll talk about that more again in a minute. Because we use it to screen people that are have cancer, not screen people, but to monitor people that have cancer, screening asymptomatic people would result in the detection of false positives causing undue alarm and cost. So if we were to take everybody and do an ovarian cancer screening test on them, it's gonna vary. Some people's gonna be a little higher than others and that does not necessarily mean they have cancer. Those types of things are best used 
to monitor the treatment of somebody after they have the disease. So if we find that Sally Sue has ovarian cancer and we draw her ovarian tumor marker and a blood sample and get the level and it's very high because she has got ovarian cancer. We put her on chemotherapy and some radiation. Over time, we hope to see that tumor marker drop. That's how we know the treatment is working. Um, we do see susceptibility to breast, ovarian, and colon cancer, which can be determined by the germline mutations in a patient with a history. You're reading a lot about this in uh, the news lately. Angelina Jolie kind of started a big thing with this um, BRAC1 and BRAC2 analysis for breast and ovarian cancer. And I actually have a neighbor and a high school friend who just on, um, two weeks ago had a hysterectomy and a double mastectomy in the same surgery. And she's 37 years old. Her BRAC2 analysis came up positive. So she elected to have both surgeries done. So by doing this, um, she figured that she decreased her chance of getting cancer by 87%. So this is a type of blood draw you can get to see if you have one of these gene mutations, which makes you susceptible to getting breast or ovarian cancer. It doesn't mean you should all run out and get this test done. It's very expensive. <laughs> but if you have a family history, you'd probably be more likely to want to do something like that. So prognosis refers to um, the tumor marker concentration gradually increases with tumor progression, reaching its higher levels when the tumor starts to metastasize to other tissues. The tumor marker levels at diagnosis can reflect the presence of malignancy and aggressiveness of tumor and help predict the outcome. So we can look at the staging and uh, history of other people and what they've had, uh, etc. But the most important, first and foremost thing I want you to know, tumor markers are there to monitor therapy effectiveness and disease recurrence. Remember we talked about Sally Sue? She has ovarian cancer. We put her on chemotherapy and um, radiation. We monitor the levels to see if they're coming down. If they do come down, great, we say she's in remission. And then we might draw her blood for the ovarian cancer tumor marker every six months for the next few years to make sure the disease is not coming back, okay? So that is what the majority of tumor markers are used for. So uh, some other examples, after surgical resection, radiation, or chemotherapy, tumor markers are observed, which I just mentioned. The effect of therapy can result in a decrease of those tumor markers, hopefully. And the, appear the appearance of tumor markers after therapy um, usually means that reoccurrence has happened. So how do we test for these guys? Same as um, the hormones, okay, so immunoassay. It's a great way to find small quantities of things in the human bloodstream. Um, some of the factors that we have to look at with this, the linearity, which is how, how high you can go, hook effect, which we're gonna talk about on the next screen, and heterophile antibodies interfering. First thing is linear range. Well, linear range we've used, and when we talk, you've had to put this in a lot of your lab reports lately, on um, how high can the lab kit go and how low can it go? you want to be able to make sure you can pick up a good range of results. Here's the hook effect. There are some um, hormones or tumor markers that can produce such high levels of concentrations that we end up with a lack of a sandwich formation of antibody and antigens. Um, so we capture and label, the capture and label antibodies that I talked about, there's an antibody and antigen that kind of makes a sandwich. Um, it will be so high that it's saturated. So we actually get a negative result. So we hate to tell somebody that, okay, it's so high that it's negative. And we wanna make sure we know how to, what to do in that situation. Usually if we do have a hook effect, the analyzers nowadays are good at picking up that saturation and it'll tell us to dilute and retest it to make sure that we pick up those really, really, really high samples that are so high they're coming up negative. So that's what the hook effect refers to. We can also have something called heterophile antibodies. And sometimes there can be circulating antibodies against immunoglobulins that can cause significant interference in these immunoassays. So this can occur in patients given mouse monoclonal antibodies. Uh, it can mess up some of our laboratory tests. But these are things that the doctors should be watching out for too. Um, we always had a, a physician 
and I can't remember what uh, type of physician he was, but we always had the hook effect with progesterones. So we had to auto dilute all of his patients, do it regular, and dilute it times 200 to eliminate any hook effect that could potentially happen. Like I said, nowadays analyzers are getting pretty sophisticated and are able to avoid any hook effect interference. All right, some other um, tumor markers. We're gonna go through a list of them now. I'm gonna um, talk about the really important details of these. First one, alpha feta protein. This is an abundant serum protein synthesized by the fetal liver and re-expressed in certain types of tumors. It's often elevated in patients with hepatocellular carcinoma and germ cell tumors. We can also find it in testicular cancer. So the big things this one's used for, liver cancer and testicular cancer. We do measure this with immunoassay. The next one is the cancer antigen CA125. This is a very uh, useful one for ovarian tumors, finding it at a very early stage. We find it in the ovary along with other um, malarian duct types of things and ovarian carcinoma cells. We do an immunoassay for this as well. Next one, carcinoembryonic antigen, CEA. This one's developed in the 1960s and it's a very good tumor marker for colorectal cancer. We also find it elevated in lung, breast, and GI tumors, but it has become kind of like the, the good one for the uh, colorectal cancer. With this one, a lot of my students memorize this, CEA, cancer eats anus. I don't know, that's how they, they memorize it. So carcinoembryonic antigen, is an oncofetal antigen for colorectal cancer. Cancer eats anus. Okay, the next one, human chorionic gonadotropin. This one is what we use to test pregnant women usually to see how far along they are or if they're pregnant or not. It can also be used in men to diagnose testicular cancer. So um, if you were to get a lab sample on a male for a HCG, it does not mean that it's wrong, it could mean that they're looking for testicular can cancer or diagnosing the treatment of testicular cancer. Again, we use immunoassay. The next one is a PSA, prostate-specific antigen. This is a, uh, it regulates spinal fluid viscosity and it dissolves the cervical, um, the cervical mucus cap allowing sperm to enter through. This is one of the only ones that is used to screen, stage, and monitor cancer. The other ones are used to stage and monitor, but this one actually we use as a screening tool. Most men over age 40 or 50 years of age will get a blood draw for a PSA every year at their physical um, to see if the levels are remaining the same. Normal level is less than four nanograms per mil, but um, you know, if it starts getting above that range, that's when they're gonna start um, checking, doing ultrasounds, things like that, looking for um, tumors that could be present. Again, we use immunoassay. A couple other tumor markers that we refer to sometimes, just know their origin. CA199 can be a GI or pancreatic cancer. 27, 29, and 15, three can mean breast cancer. And another important one here that uh, I'd like to mention is alkaline phosphatase. We learned about this enzyme in chemistry one, but remember it's involved in the liver and the bone. So if this is elevated, if this is elevated, it could mean um, cancer is spread to the liver or especially the bone, okay? So a lot of times um, little kids have leukemia and when all those blast cells are growing like crazy, you learn about this in hematology too, but all those blast cells are growing like crazy and it can cause the bone to actually spread and break, therefore increasing that alkaline phosphatase level. Okay, this completes the section on tumor markers. Have a great day.